Let's just remain standing a moment while we bow our heads for a word of prayer. As we bow our heads, I wonder tonight how many would like to be remembered in prayer and have something on your heart you want God to do for you. Just raise up your hand. The Lord grant these requests now as we bow our heads and our hearts before you. Our Heavenly Father, we are approaching thy throne of grace again in the name of Jesus Christ, the great Son of God. We thank thee for the opportunity to come with the assurance that you will hear and answer what we ask for. We pray, Father, that you will forgive our sins, that is, our unbelief. And, Father, we pray that you will give us faith, abundance of faith tonight. And you know what was behind every hand there down in the heart. They needed something, Lord. They raised their hand reverently, expecting something from you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, whatever it was, that it will be granted to the people. We thank you for the visitation last evening. We pray that you will return to us tonight with the abundance of power, grace, and will grant to us the desires of our heart. For truly, our desire is to do your will and to see your will be done. And we know what your will is concerning the sick, that you was striped across your back for our healing. By his stripes we were healed. And Father, we pray that it's your great will will be done tonight to give us faith to believe that in abundance, that every sick person might be healed and every person that's lost might remember that he was wounded for our transgressions. Grant it, Lord. May they know that as long as there is a, a bloody sacrifice there for them, their sins cannot be seen by God. But if they should die without publicly confessing that and accepting it and being born again, there would be no way at all for them to ever enter into the kingdom. May this be the night that every person from under the blood may quickly slip beneath the blood tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we'll give thee the praise. Amen. Very uh, great privilege to be here tonight and to speak again. And last evening we had such a wonderful time, visitation of the Lord, but I kept you too late. I can never make it on time, somehow. Kind of almost uh, got a little too much sun today. I was, my little son, Joseph, then asked me to go swimming. So the place where we're staying has a little pool kind of fenced in back there. And he said, come watch me, Dad. I can swim. I said, all right. I went down there this morning, took my Bible and some, to write some notes. And while I was studying, he here he come with his little bathing trunks on. He said, watch me, Daddy, I can dive. Well, if I ever seen a frog jump in the water. And uh, he got up and the uh, water spurting out of his nose and mouth. He said, how did I do? I said, you're doing fine. And I just got to thinking of one time I said the same thing to my dad. A little old pond, before we got to go to the river, there's a pond. And us kiddies had to almost keep the green scum back off of it. And we water was over about six inches deep, and I kept telling my dad I can swim. So one Sunday afternoon, he walked out there, and he had a little soapbox sitting there. And I got back in the bushes and stripped my clothes, what there was to strip, just pull one nail, you know. And How many ever seen one like that? I'm, just a pair of overhauls on with no suspenders, just have a, a fodder twine across for a gallus, and then just a nail, just pull a nail, and that's all you have to do. <laughs> Jump right in. And so I'm... Got up on this box and helped my doge, you know, it flashed off into that mud flew about that high. My dad sitting out there watching me. I said, how am I doing? He said, get out of there and we'll get you back. <laughs> I was thinking how long that's been. And, you know, time just gets away from us, doesn't it? We just don't have time to look like anymore to do things. And time is not waiting for no one, so we must... Work while we can, because the hour is coming when this generation will go, and there will be another generation coming, if there is another generation. 
truthfully, I say it with all my heart. I don't know when he's coming. None of us does. But truly, I don't believe there'll be another generation. I believe Christ will come in this generation. I don't know what time. Now, it may be tonight or it may be 10 years from now or 20. But I believe he'll be in this generation. I'm believing that. If he doesn't, I want to live just like he was anyhow. Because I know that it may be my last day or your last day. And then remember, if we go before he comes, we will be up and in his presence or raised before the others are changed. The trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment to twinkle and die and be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Look at the order of the resurrection. See, God knows that we long to see our loved ones. And if we got there to meet him first, we'd be looking around and see if mother, dad, and the rest of them was there. But see how the Holy Spirit in his wisdom, we meet one another first. And then when we get there and sing Amazing Grace, that's when there's going to be a time of worship. Amen. You think I act funny now, watch me up there. <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful time for me and all of us that when we get there. Now, let's read somehow the blessed old Bible here tonight. Let's turn over to Romans, the fourth chapter, and read just a portion out of the book of Romans. I want to read two places tonight, out of Genesis and out of the book of Romans. Now, in the book of Romans, fourth chapter, 17th verse, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him who he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was written, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offense and was raised again for our justification. Oh, how I love that. That's one of my favorite scripture readings of the Bible. Because it's so positive what God was, what he promised and swore that he would do. And now I chose this subject because that I think that on any meeting to see the faith that we saw exercised here last night that not a feeble person among us, but what was healed, what the power of God came, and what he did. Then I thought if we could build around something positive, making a, an achievement to a goal, then how wonderful it would be when we could hit that great night or hour of climax. And we must remember that nothing can be done without faith and it first has to be confessed, for he is, the, he is the author of faith, we know that, and that nothing can be done without faith, and without faith it's impossible to please God. And now he is the high priest of our confession. Now the, the King James here in the book of Hebrews puts it, a profession. To profess and confess is the same thing. Profess and confess. Confess means to say the same thing. By stripes, I am healed. See? Now, by life, I am saved. And now, then first we've got to confess it. And he sets as a mediator. And the only mediator between God and man. And he sets there to make intercessions 
upon what we confess that he has done. What a, what a sound, solid thing that is. And now, I want to read another scripture found over in the book of, of Genesis, the 22nd chapter. And let's begin reading here about the 7th verse. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him up on the, on the altar, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou, that thou fearest God, and seest thou withhold not the only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up, on, up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What I want to take the subject there, if it would be called a subject, Jehovah Jireh. The word means the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. Uh, if he doesn't have one, he can provide one. I'm so grateful for that. Now, this great subject, I'm now reading there that Abraham staggered not at the promise through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God. Now, Abraham was the one that God made the covenant and promised to. And Abraham, not him only, but his seed after him. Abraham and his seed. And now, remember this now. If we are dead in Christ, we are Abraham's seed. If we are born again. Now, let's be real careful about this now as we study this lesson. And now if you listen closely, I'm sure the Holy Spirit will reveal to you and you'll catch the whole and then it will light the city and everything around you. If we just take our time and catch the idea, what the Holy Spirit's trying to get to us. Now, Abraham called, the, was given the promise, uh, Abraham and his seed. Now, there's so much today, friends, that's called Christianity that's not Christianity. Amen. Now, I just hate to say this, but... I would rather stand here and be real popper among the people and, and everybody patting you on your back and everything like that. But then I've got to meet that group at the judgment Amen. to give an account for it. So uh, I just have to be honest. Now we can look upon congregations and upon the world today, upon what's called Christianity, and find out it's a million miles from Christianity. And it's predicted in the Bible to be that way. Now, many accept Christ in the way of saying, well, I believe him. Well, the devil believes the same thing. Amen. See? And many of them try to accept it upon emotion. Say, well, I spoke with tongues. I danced in the spirit. I've seen witch doctors do the same thing. Yeah. And devil dancers in Africa. Right. Sure. Speak in tongues and drink blood out of a human skull and call on the devil. My mother is an Indian, half Indian, and, and her people, 
I've seen them take pencil and lay it down like that and watch a pencil run and write in unknown tongues and stand there and interpret it. Calling on the devil. Sure. See, you can't go by emotions. See, your life that you live testifies what you are. Amen. See, no matter what kind of sensation, you cannot base Christianity on any sensation. It's a lie. Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. Amen. Not by their profession, not by what they say. And Jesus also said, you draw nigh unto me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. That's, that's their profession. See, your life tells what. And if a man says that he believes God and denies one word of this Bible or changes it in any way, why, it's got to be wrong. You said it doesn't make any difference about these little things. It certainly does. One little word is what takes us in all this trouble. Not disbelieve it, but just misplace it. Eve just had Satan to mis- just give her a reason. Down at Brother Williams, I just got to you going through that down in Santa Maria. That's the thing that brought us from the Garden of Eden and caused every sick child as I prayed for a little spastic baby laying there a few moments ago coming in. What caused that? Because Eve never disbelieved it, but she just took a reason that it would be reasonable this would be all right. And it caused every death, every sickness, every sorrow, every heartache. And how are we going to get back in if it, co- if it caused 6,000 years of this? How are we going back with anything less than every perfect word the way it's written? The devil won the battle over the human race by reasoning with the human race. Just reason why it stands to reason this would be. It stands to reason. If the reasoning is contrary to the word, then the reason is wrong. The word is right. Just the way it's written. Don't put any private interpretation. Just say it the way it's written and believe it like that. God's took care of it. It's just exactly the way it's supposed to be. So let's just believe it that way. Now, it's the word. Every word, every uh, the Holy Spirit in a man... Every sentence of the Bible, the Holy Spirit in you will punctuate with amen. Because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Amen. And if he's in you, how can he say, well, that was for another age, that was for this or that was for that. How can he say that and be the Holy Spirit in you? Amen. Can't do it. He has to say amen to it. Amen. Now, as I said the other day, the first thing God gave his People to fortify them was the word, and he's never changed. He can't change. Now, creeds won't work. Denominations won't work. Education won't work. None of these things, every one of them has totally failed and will fail. There's only one thing that'll be work. That is the word. Amen. And the only one way we can come by the word is by the blood. Only place that anybody ever worshiped God had to come under the blood. No other preparation at all. You can't come under the name of Methodist. You can't come under the name of Pentecost. You can't come under the name of Catholic. There's dozens of Catholic churches different, different from one another. The Orthodox and Greek and Roman, and there's broke up as bad as the Protestant. The Protestants, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, or whatever, are all different kinds. And there they are, see? But there's one ground for fellowship. That's under the blood. Amen. And the blood is a life, and it'll always agree with the Word. Yeah. Always with the Word. Now, we know the life is in the male sex. It's in the blood, the hemoglobin. Through there, the hen can lay an egg. But if she hasn't been with the male bird, it'll never hatch. Certainly, it's not fertile. That's the way I've made many rude statements in a female bird can lay a nest full of eggs. And she can be as loyal to them as she wants to be. She can hover them and, with her wings and turn them every few minutes so they'll be sure to hatch. And, and she'll get so hungry and fast while she's on the nest to be loyal to those eggs until she gets so poor she can't fly off the nest. If she wasn't with the male bird and those eggs fertile, they'll lay right in the nest and rock. If she wasn't with the mate. Exactly. And that's about the way our churches has got. Just tuck in a bunch under cold formal profession, some uh, mystic dance or some sensation and what do they do? Disbelieve the word till we got just a nest full of rotten eggs. It's time to clean the nest and start over again until they come in contact with the male Christ Jesus. Get 
born again of the Word. Then they've got to hatch because it's life. Some time ago I was eating dinner with a, an old Methodist preacher and I heard the agriculture hour on from, from uh, Louisville before each club was talking. If they had, had a machine that could put out a grain of corn just like they grow in the field. Said it would make the same kind of corn flakes, same kind of corn bread, just the same corn. Cut it like that, put it under the light, take it to the laboratory. It's the heart's in the right place and everything and the same amount of moisture, calcium, potash, whatever it's in the corn is laying just exactly. Said, if you ever took a handful out of the sack that's grown in the field and the sack that the machine mixed or made and mixed them up, you could never tell the difference with your natural eye or cutting it apart or any science could ever find the difference. The only way you could tell the difference is bury them. Yeah. That tells it. A man might look like a Christian, he might act like a Christian, he might impersonate a Christian, but unless he's got the germ of life in there, he cannot rise again. Got to have that life germ in there. Have eternal life. And any person who studied Greek knows that that eternal comes from the word zoe, which means God's own life. That become a part of him as you are a part of your father. You become a part of God, and God's own life is divided and put in you, and it can't die because it's eternal. Anything that begins, ends, but he never did begin, so he cannot end. He's eternal, and you're eternal with him. Can no more die than he can die because you become a part of him. You're born of him. Amen. Just keep talking about that, and I'll never get to this lesson. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to be a Christian. I, 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 I wouldn't trade places with nobody in the world. Not presidents, kings, if they give me the whole world so I could live a million years. After there, I would die. After a million years, but now a million years, well, I won't be nothing. Now we just keep on living. No doubt. So it's great to be a Christian. Talking of Abraham, let's go back. Now, we are Abraham's seed if we are in Christ. And then if you are Abraham's seed, you have the same faith that Abraham had. Because it was his faith that we're talking about, especially in the church now. It's the royal seed of Abraham. There was two seeds of Abraham. One of them was the natural, Isaac. The other one was Christ, the promise. So through Isaac, Israel was blessed. Through Christ, he became the father of nations. See? So the royal seed, how much greater that would be than the natural seed of Abraham. So if you are in Christ, you have a super seed. A super to what Abraham was because you come by the royal seed, Christ. If you are dead in Christ, then are ye Abraham's children. And you have Abraham's seed and Abraham's faith. And Abraham's faith was in God's word regardless of what took place. Amen. He called those things which were not as though they were because God said so. What a promise. Now, let's go back a little piece and base our thoughts. Let's go back to, before we get to Jehovah Jireh, to Abraham, let's go back, fall back a little bit in the scripture. Let's go back to uh, the 12th chapter, we read here in the 22nd chapter, let's go back to the 12th chapter, the covenant made to Abraham. Now, the covenant, there had been three, two covenants. Now, God is perfected in threes. We know the numerals of God. Perfection in three, worship in seven, twelves and forties, temptation, fifties, jubilee, and so forth. God in his, in his numeral. Now, God is perfected in three, like Father, Son, Holy Ghost, justification, sanctification, baptism, Holy Ghost, and so forth. Now, there had been two covenants. One of them was the Adam covenant. God made a covenant with a man, if you will, I will. And he broke it. Then God made a covenant with Noah. That's the Noah covenant. And it was broke. Now, he's making the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant, according to Genesis, the 12th chapter, it was given unconditionally. Therefore, it's eternal because it's unconditional. Not if you will, I will. He said, I have. I've already done it. Not I will do it. I have done it. That's all that. That base is faith. See? Not God's determined to save man. He make a covenant, if you will, I will. He'd break it. Another one, you will, I will. He broke it. 
Man can't keep his covenant. So God saves man by his grace. Yeah. Under a covenant that's unconditional. Yeah. Unconditional covenant. Oh my, never ending. That was all of it. Three, perfect. Noah, Abraham, and uh, I mean, no, uh, Adam, Noah, and Abraham. Now, that's the reason we are Abraham's children. That covenant cannot be in, never in, because it is unconditional. It, it, it is because you do something. It's because God did something. Yeah. Not because you chose God. God chose you. Do you believe that? Yeah. People say, oh, Brother Branham, I sought God and sought God. and You did not. I hate to tell you that, but you didn't. God sought you. Yeah. It was God seeking you. Jesus said, you haven't chose me, I chose you. No man can come to me except my Father draws him, and all the Father has given me will come to me. Now, see, it wasn't, no man can glory in anything, it's God. Oh, how marvelous to see the, the real grace of God, how it's, and how people has took the message of grace and made a disgrace out of it. Like my precious church and you precious Baptist people, when you mess up grace like that, you've really got it in a mess. <laughs> Someone said to me not long ago, said, Brother Branham, now you know you was a good Baptist. I said, I still feel that, but I've just raised up a little higher. He said, well, now look, said Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. How much more could Abraham do but believe? And he said, when we believe God, we receive the Holy Spirit. I said, how different from St. Paul? St. Paul said in Acts 19, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Not when you believe, since you have believed. He said, well, Abraham believed God. That's all he could do. I said, true. But then God gave him the order of circumcision as a confirmation that he had received his faith. And if he has never circumcised you yet by the Holy Ghost, he hasn't received your faith yet. That's right. That is the circumcision out of the heart and spirit. God gives the Holy Ghost as a confirmation he's received your faith. Now, if you stop believing and scrumbling around and just believe God, God will circumcise that heart and that cuts off all unbelief. Circumcises the world and all unbelief away from you and then you stand the word alone. Jesus said, if you abide me in my word and you then ask what you will, it'll be given to you. Amen. That's what's matter at the church today. It's under emotion. It's under education. It's under creed. No wonder it's smothered down. Yeah. See? So we need a circumcision to cut the whole thing away. Come back to God and His Word and believe it the way it's wrote there. And don't argue with it. Just stay with it. God made a promise. God keeps His promise. He can't do nothing else but keep His promise and remain God. Now, this unconditional covenant, not if you will, I will, but uh, I will later on, or something like that. I have already give the land to you and your seed after you. <laughs> Amen. See, already done it. Hallelujah. It's a finished work. You said to Abraham he did that. Yes, not only Abraham, but his seed after him. Amen. And if we were Abraham's seed, it's a finished product. Those who he foreknew, he called. Those who he called, he justified. Those who he has justified, he has already glorified. Amen. What you scared about? Amen. That's right. And the Antichrist in the last days, according to Revelation, deceived all that dwelt upon the face of the earth, whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life since the last revival. No, before the foundation of the world. That's when your name was put in the Lamb's book of life, when the Lamb was slain. God spoke the word. It was in his thinking and his thought. He spoke the word and everything happened just at that time. This is just God's seed materializing. That's all. His words coming down. Now, when the light of God flashes across that, quickly that seed recognizes it because it's born of God. It's Abraham's seed, foreknown by God. That's why the light flashes is to catch that seed. If it, we've had a revival. Joel said, we fussed so much about latter rain, had movements called latter rain. Latter rain, former rain, inner rain, outer rain. I was reading the other day. Do you know what former rain means in the Hebrew word? I can't call it right now. I never wrote it down. It skipped my mind. But former rain, the first rain means a rain of teaching. The second rain is a spirit that comes up on what's been taught and produces a crop. 
Why is it we had such a revival? Pentecostal, Baptist, all the other trees put forth their buds, as Jesus said they would be. And what have we hatched out? The Baptist said they got a million more in 44. Look at the Catholic, how they increased. Look at all denominations. Look at Pentecost. What do we do? We sow denominational seeds. We reap the denominational harvest. While the church ought to be on fire for God right now, if there had been a word seed so back there and there'd be signs, wonders, miracles, and that church would be together, one heart, one accord, and marching towards Zion for the rapture. Amen. Amen. Right. What did we do? We had intellectual speeches instead of the word. We had reasoning against the word and everything else. We got to get back to the word. God, hey, we'll do it. God said, I will restore, saith the Lord, all the years that the canker worms and palmer worms eat. It's going to bloom out in the evening time. There will come forth one with a message. He'll restore the hearts of the faith of the children back to the faith of the fathers. He promised it in Malachi 4, and he would do it. Return them back again. Now, that isn't the Elijah that was talked of in the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 11, if you can receive it, John, there was the Elias that was to come of Malachi 3. Behold, I say my messenger before my face. Malachi 3. You find that? But remember the Malachi 4, the message comes, the terrible day of the Lord shall come and shall burn up the whole earth and the righteous shall walk out upon the ashes of the wicked. That never happened after John. No, if that was it, then the scripture has lost its hold. It said something that wasn't so. We got 2,000 years since then. The world hasn't been burned. So, not at all. Neither has the righteous walked out upon the, the, the ashes of the wicked. But we're still waiting for that something that's going to take the faith and restore the faith of the children back to the original Pentecostal tree that the canker worm eat up, the Roman canker worm, caterpillar, all their denomination and creeds eat it down. God said, I will restore it again in the last days. It will be restored. God shall send the Holy Ghost in such a way upon planted word that will restore. The word of God is a seed that a sower went forth to sow. Now, the covenant was given unconditionally. Now, Israel, the seed natural, exchanged that and lost it in Exodus 19 when they made that rational thing to take away the grace and accepted law in its place. What a rational mistake that Israel made there. Look, God, after he made the covenant with Abraham, Grace had already provided a prophet deliverer for him down in Egypt to carry out the word of Abraham. Remember Moses under the bush? God said, I've heard the cries of my people and I remember my promise. Before there's any law, grace provided it. Grace had provided a sacrifice for their guilt. A lamb. Grace had provided a covenant. Circumcision has already been provided before law. Grace had provided a pillar of fire to lead them. Following a prophet. A security that the prophet had told them the truth. It was the word that he was talking about. They know that God promised it and here was a pillar of fire confirming it. What a devil security. Hey man. Grace had done that. But they wanted something for themselves that they could do. Have their own creeds and denominations and what more. Make Pharisees, Sadducees and something they could do themselves. Man's always trying to save himself. You can't do that. Amen. God's already done it. Amen. You just have to accept it and believe it. Pillar of fire. To lead them and guide them. To lead them in a way. A power. Grace had provided a power to condemn their enemy. And to make them free. The power had already been given. They crossed the Red Sea. They smote uh, Pharaoh. They had done all these things with grace. And then they exchanged grace for a law. But that had nothing to do with the royal seed of Abraham. The royal seed has tried to do the same thing, go back under some kind of a creed. Instead of taking grace in the word and believing it. With that, there will come forth a royal seed. We'll get that after a bit. A little further on. Let's go back now to Genesis 12. 
God called Abraham by grace. Not because he was a different person. He was just Abraham. Just an ordinary man. Not because he was a priest or a dignitary. He was just a farmer. He come down from the city of uh, the Babylon Tower with his father. And they went to Chaldea, uh, Ur of Chaldea. And there was a farmer, perhaps farmed in the daytime and raised his food. He had married his half-sister, Sarah. And uh, they had no children. And Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. And Sarah was 65 years old. And God told Abraham when he called him, he said, I am going to make you a father of nations and going to give him a baby by Sarah. Now, he was sterile. And she was, well, 65. She was 10 or 15 years past menopause. He lived with her since she was about 16 or 18 years old. His half-sister. And say, he'd been a husband to her all these years until he was 75. And she was 65. And then God comes down and said, I'm going to give you a baby by her. And he staggered not at the promise of God, but believed it. Could you imagine an old man, 75 years old, and a woman, 65, going down, shaking down to the doctor and say, Doctor, I want you to get the hospital ready now. We might call you any night because, you know, we're going to have a baby. <laughs> the doctor would say, y- yes, sir. You, uh, <clears throat> uh, as soon as you get on the phone, say, Bird, go after him. There's something wrong. And everybody that takes God at his promise is considered by the world crazy. Yes. Paul said in a way that's called heresy. That's the way I worship the God of our Father. Harris is crazy, we know. The foolishness to the carnal mind. Faith is crazy to everybody but God and the one that's got the faith. <laughs> that's right. But God promised Abraham and Abraham believed it. He never said, God, how will it be? He said, all right, God, I believe it. I can see him go home and say, Sarah, let's go down and get us several yards of bird eye and get us some pins and get us some booties. We'll have a baby. Oh, my. First 30 days passed or 28 days. How you feeling, dear? No different. Bless God, we're going to have it anyhow. Amen. Hallelujah. How you know? God said so. Some of us can be prayed for one night and set in a meeting where the Holy Ghost is falling. The next morning, if we sound well, solid, uh, I'm still sick at my stomach a little bit. I can't move my hands anymore. You, Abraham, seed. <laughs> Stagger not the promise of God through unbelief. Amen. <laughs> Some come up in the church, the devil can get amongst a, a group of fine people and get in there and go to whipping that congregation around. The first thing you know, some say, huh, I'm going to leave this whole thing. What wasn't nothing to it in the first place. Abraham seed. <laughs> first little flaw the devil can show you, then you're, you're through with it. It showed you didn't believe it in the first place. Jesus said the kingdom's like a man took a net, went to the sea and cast in the sea. When he come in, he had everything. That's right. That's what, the, that's what a revival catches. What is in a net? You got frogs, spiders, turtles, crawfish, snakes, and fish. <laughs> yeah. It ain't very long till the turtle said, Well, this is no place for me. Right back in the mud he goes. Yeah. The old water spider looked around saying, Huh, I can't have a card game here. So down into the mud she goes again, like a hog to its water or a dog to its vomit. Yeah. That's right. And then Abraham's seed. Oh, my. Such a disgrace. Abraham's seed believes God's word. Yeah. Sit back there and say, yeah, that's God, I'm Pentecostal. And somebody preached something on the word, there it is, wrote right out. Hallelujah, I don't believe that. No, sir, Abraham's seed. <laughs> now, if it's some nonsense, of course you don't believe it. But if it's a word, it's the truth. Amen. Uh, Abraham's seed holds that word and nothing else. Another month's passed. Sarah, sweetheart... How you feeling now? You know, another 28 days has passed. How you feeling? No different, darling. Glory to God. It's too much greater miracle than it was if it happened last month. A year passed. Hallelujah. Shall I lay these little booties away? No, sir, you keep them there. We're going to have that baby. Hallelujah. How you know you're going to have it? God said so. Amen. That settles it. After 25 years passed. 
How you feeling, Sarah? No different. Glory to God, it's 25 years more of a miracle now. Amen. He staggered out at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, holding to the Word of God, and calling those things which were not as though they were. Why? God said so. Yes. Oh, my. Hallelujah. Abraham's seed today. Why? What we call Abraham's seed is weaker than a broth made out of a shad of a chicken to starve to death. <laughs> yes, sir. God wants rugged Christians. He takes God's word literally. It's the same thing. Amen. God said so. That's Abraham's seed. Born of the Spirit and the Word of God. That's what stands. Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass. That's it. What God promised, God's able to do. God don't fail. He can't fail. There's one thing God can't do, and that's fail. He cannot fail. That's the only thing He can't do. But He can't fail. When God promised it, it's the truth. It's there forever. It's completely settled forever. When God speaks a word, it's already settled. This world was made by just the word of God. He just said, let there be, and there was. <laughs> the very dirt that you're setting over tonight, the very wood that you're setting on, is nothing but the word of God made manifest. Hallelujah! I feel religious when I think about Abraham. Know that we can be his seed. The seed of Abraham with all these promises. Not only to make it sure God held up his hand and swore by himself that he'd do it. The oath is always, con the covenant is confirmed by an oath. And God swore by himself because there's no higher to swear by. He swore by himself that he would do it. Now, what the world, how, we, what, what's the matter with us? Such a promise as that. A faith built around something like that. A faith built, a word that promised these things in the last days. And here we see them happening right before us and still stoop around. Abraham's seed. Oh my I want you to hold on to that Abraham seed. Genesis 12. What God required of Abraham was a complete separation. Now today they want mixers. Oh, when we choose a pastor, he's got to have curly hair and right out of Hollywood, you know, and you can say, ah, oh, man, so pretty, and wears the classes of clothes and drives a super duper Cadillac and, and uh, so forth like that. And it's a good mixer. He does this and he'll take a little drink once in a while with us to be sociable. He comes to the old lady's card party and they stitch and sew and sew and stitch and talk about me so and so and so forth, you know, and all like that. And they have to be that kind of a, a mixer. God said, separate ye fallen ones. Amen. Amen. Separation, come out from among them and be not partakers of their unclean things. God wants separation, total annihilation from sin. Separate. That's what's the trouble today, the reason we can't be Abraham. See, we can't separate ourselves from dogmas and creeds and so forth. Call Christianity to the living word. Separate yourself from your unbelief and believe God's word. God will make it manifest to you. Right. Genesis 12, God said, separate yourself from all your kindred and from everything around you. Oh, my. We can't separate ourselves from card playing. <laughs> I went in a restaurant today when brother come in there. And I watched some delinquent teenager come in there and wife and I was trying to eat. And I thought, praise God, let's hurry, honey, before somebody comes in. And there's some teenager come in there slurping around. I'd be afraid to meet that boy in the dark. And he put a machine needle in there and a record and began to play that old boogly woogly stuff and, and uh, stand there with going like this, you know, hit yourself like that. I said, goodness sakes, Murray. Me, he said, don't, don't go there to pay that bill. You wait right here. Let me go with you. She was afraid. Anybody in that? Such things as we have today. A Christian nation. <laughs> oh, what a thing. Separation! Amen. Ninety percent of those singing choirs, the Elvis Presley and a Pat Boone and all that, and a Peabody and Ernie or what they call him down here, why, well, it's worse than Judas is a carrot. Judas is a carrot, sold and got 30 pieces of silver. Elvis beat him. He got several fleets of Cadillacs and a lot of popularity. And because these little kids see all that, Colonel say, he's very religious. That's the devil. Absolutely. God don't tolerate such stuff as that. That's a blinder here in the last days. Come back to the Word. Separate yourself from all the ungodly things that touch not their things. I will receive you. 
gospel, we need to hand it barehanded, not with some ecclesiastical gloves on, hitting somebody on the back that gets a nest full of rotten eggs again, making somebody a district man or a presbyter, a bishop or something or another. What does that, how can you have faith when you got respect, or get honor one from another? We look to God in Him alone. Honor comes from God. He's the one that... We honor Him by holding His Word as a torch and walking like a man or a woman before God. Sure. Complete separation. Genesis 13. Lot went backwards. You remember, they got a little... After they separated themselves and crossed over the river and went into the land, God said, Abraham, I'll give it all to you now, but you haven't fully obeyed me. And the first thing you know, there come up a little fuss about the herdsmen amongst their cattle. And Genesis 13. What happened? The herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of, of Abraham watched Abraham, the brotherly act. He said, let there be no arguments between us. We are brethren. Lot represented the lukewarm church. And he said, look out. Take the choice. Whatever you want, you go ahead and take it. You go east, I'll go west, so forth. Uh, you go west, I'll go east. You go north, I'll go south, and so forth. You take your choice. And Lot, already been down in Egypt, and he got the eye on a little popularity. Got a little money in his pockets. That's where the church made his mistake. Yes. I say this with reverence, brethren. Yes. The Pentecostal church would be better off with a tambourine out there on the corner with the old-fashioned men and women with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they would in these great big shrines and morgues you're living in today under all this tiny rock and stuff. Right. They want to act like the rest of them. That's where we got it. Why didn't you stay the way you were, the way God started you out? The very thing you fussed about, you will turn around and done the same thing. That's the way Lot did. Went down into Egypt. And the first thing you know, he got his eyes on Egypt. And then he looked over and he seen Sodom. Luxury. Take it easy. And he went eastward. Toward Wimmer. Went east. Instead of going west with Abraham, he went east because it was a way of luxury. He went on towards the east. That's the way the churches did today. See, they went backwards. As I said last night, the sun rises in the east and goes west. And the Son of God visited the east first and went westward. They've dimmed it out through 2,000 years. But there will be light in the evening time, this prophet said. Instead of following the sun, they go back to where the sun was. Today you have to speak something about divine healing, about the prophecy, about the nine spiritual gifts or something. Let's go back and see what Moody said, what Sankey said, what Knox said, what Calvin said. They lived in the day when the sun was shining there. Yes. We are going on to perfection. Amen. Amen. A French scientist said about 300 years ago, fruit of a rolling a ball around the globe. He said, if anybody would ever go the terrific speed of 30 miles an hour, gravitation take them off the earth. Scientifically proved it. You think science ever referred to that? No, sir. They got them going about 2,000 miles an hour. Trying to get him to go farther. They don't look back to that. But ministers, we'll look back and see what Moody said, what Sankey said. That's where the sun was. Here's where it's at today. It's on the west coast in the evening time. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give me evening light. Amen. Not back to Luther's justification or Wesley's sanctification. But we're at the last day. <laughs> Amen. When the evening lights are shining. When we're at the last time. Follow the sun. But Lot went back because it was easy, luxury. Look at Miss Lot when she got back there. Well, she must become the queen of the societies of the city. Lot became the mayor. Or, oh, brother, they had it made. Well, I mean to say, that's the way the people has tucked Miss Lot today. Look the way our people are acting today. Look at our people in churches. Let's look at it. Look at our women. Look at him today. I, I was in Hollywood uh, or Los Angeles recently. I was waiting for Brother Argenbright to come up. And there stood a girl come up there. I looked and I staggered. Uh, I looked at her. I thought, I'm a missionary. I've seen plaguery. I've seen leprosy. But i never seen anything like that. She had one of these waterhead hair cuts. These, uh, you, know, you know, what you call, look like a waterhead, you know, the, uh, the first lady. Yeah, like a Jezebel. Like that. And she had blue and green and might have been a nice looking woman. But all that stuff on her, she looked like some African hottentot. I walked up and was going to pray for the woman. I thought, lady, if you don't mind, I'll pray for the sick. I've never seen anything like that. Tell me what it is. And another woman got talking to her and she is the same way. 
Oh, my. Oh, you say that was Presbyterian. Pentecostal? Sure. And the Bible says it's a dishonorable thing for a woman to cut her hair. She does it. She dishonors her head. She dishonors the angel, the angel of light. The seven church angels, the one bringing the light, will stay with the word. Dishonorable. She ought to have hair on her head. My, such a... It used to be wrong for him to do it. it in first Pentecost, it was wrong. What happened? Yes. It did run well. What happened? Some of our Pentecostal women dressing them, dressing look like a skin over a wiener. Out here somewhere. Kind of, that's right. I'm not saying that for no joke. This is no place for joking. Amen. This is the pulpit. Some woman said to me one night, I told them how they were dressing. Said, uh, she said, well, I don't wear shorts. I, I, I wear slacks. I said, that's worse than ever. God said a woman that'll put on a garment pertains to a man's abomination in the sight of God. Yeah. Right? Amen. Let me tell you something, lady. You young woman, dresses yourself out there, you're going to answer at the day of judgment for committing adultery. Yeah. You say, I'm just as pure as a lily. Yeah, but Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart already. Amen. You might don't have to do the act. Whosoever is angry with his brothers out of cause has killed already. See, the only thing you have to do, and if that sinner looks at you the way you're dressed, all carried out the way you are, reared back and pushed out and pushed in, and I'm kind of a clothes on, then you go out. Uh, listen, that's not jokes. This is the gospel. Amen. And you do like that and some sinner look at you to lust at you at the day of judgment when he answers for committing adultery. Who caused it? You did. Amen. Amen. You'll answer for it because you presented yourself that way. Why well, you say they, they don't make any other kind of clothes. They make sewing machines and still sell goods. It's no excuse at all. It's because you got away from the word. Amen. That's not popular. That's hard. Some famous preacher come to the other day and laid his hands on me. He said, I'm going to lay my hands on you and cast out the evil. I said, what? Talking about them women like that. He said, people regard you as a prophet. And said, I said, I'm no prophet. He said, they regard you as that, Brother Branham. And said, you ought to be teaching those people, them women, how to get great spiritual blessings. And keep telling them about they're cutting their hair and things like that. They ain't going to listen to that. I said, I know it. He said, well, won't you teach them greater things? I said, how can I preach, teach to them algebra when they don't even know their ABCs? Not even the common decency. Amen. And you man that'll let your women act like that, I've got little respect for you being a Christian man. Amen. Seed of Abraham. Amen. 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 I better leave that alone. I'll make you all get up and go home. All right. One of these days, you're going to fail finding something up there. Amen. You said, don't make any difference. It did to Paul. It did to God in the Garden of Eden. The Bible said that the woman should have long hair. And without it, where are you at? Why well, say, it don't make any difference. The Bible said it does. Amen. Don't let the devil reason with you and tell you it's modern, it's all right. It isn't all right. Amen. He said, I didn't know it before. You know it now. Amen. Search it and find if it's right. I'll leave that alone. See, all right. Genesis 13. Modern. Uh -huh. Go back where the sun was. Not where the sun is. Where the sun was. Wife, I imagine Lot's wife, how she got in society. That's the way that we got in society. That's the way we Pentecostals got into it. We become settled organization over here in a little against one against the other and against this and to make you tuck in anything. It's exactly right. What did Samuel say when Israel wanted to, wanted to make a king, wanted Saul for a king? Samuel come to him and said, have I ever taken your money for a living? Have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? Oh, they said, sure, you're God's prophet. You told us the truth and what you said come to pass, but we want the king anyhow. And whenever you started letting down the bars and letting this and that and everything else come in like that, you went modern. Yeah. And the church is just like the rest of them today. What we need is a Pentecostal house cleaning. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Hey, Amen. It's a shame a Baptist has to tell you that, ain't it? But it's the truth. It's a... Right. Yeah. I believe the Bible. Yeah. I believe God's word's right. All right. Abraham. Then Abraham took the, in the 14th verse... Of the 13th chapter, after Lot separated himself and Abraham completely obeyed God, then God come to him. Now he's ready to bless him. 
until the Pentecostal church gets away from all of its creeds and dogmas and acting like the world and looking like the world and talking like the world and stay home on Wednesday night to watch We Love Susie and instead of coming to prayer meeting and things like that, paying your tithes out to some preacher out here on some kind of a radio program to make fun of the very thing that you stand for. That's right. And all this kind of stuff that's carried on in the name of Pentecost, it's a disgrace. I speak for the Christian businessmen internationally. As many of them sitting here now. Here the other night, here about a year ago it has been, I was in Jamaica. And they had all the slaver to the islands in there one night. And these men getting up testifying, glory to God. I was a little businessman down the corner. Hallelujah. Got four Cadillacs now. Glory to God. And I went back up there to the Flamingo Motel that night and stood there. I said, I'm ashamed of you. I said, you man, here to represent Christ, trying to tell a businessman how much you got. He's got more than you have or ever will have. That's a whole lot different from the first Pentecostals. The first Pentecostals sold what they had and divided amongst the poor and went and preached the gospel. Hey! Some little Swedish singer from Chicago, I ain't going to call his name, he's a precious brother of mine. He stood up and said, Brother Branham, though you, if we believe you to be a prophet, but I'm going to tell you right now you're wrong. I said, tell me where, brother. He said... When them people sold what they had and laid it at the feet of the apostles and distributed it, he said, there's the worst act they ever did. I said, do you mean to tell me the Holy Spirit makes a wrong act? And he said, it was wrong. I'll prove it to you. I said, said, then when the persecution rose, they had no place to go. They wandered about everywhere exactly in the will of God, preaching the gospel wherever they went. They had no place to return. God don't make no mistakes. Right. Oh, what a difference is Pentecost it was and Pentecost it is. Yeah. There it is. After Abraham separated himself from Lot. Just exactly what God told him to do. Separate every sin that so easily beset us. Take everything out. There. Then God said, Abraham, now you're heir of all things. Look east. Look west. Look north. Look south. Walk through the land. It's all yours. Amen. You separate your thing, yourself from sin, unbelief. There's only one sin, and that's unbelief. Committing adultery is not a sin. Drinking liquor is not a sin. Telling lies is not a sin. That's the attributes of unbelief. If you believe, you wouldn't do those things. Certainly. Jesus said in St. John 5, 24, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. That's Zoe, Holy Spirit, because he believed. Correctly. Until you receive that, you're a make-belief. That's in that group. But when they really believe, separating themselves... Then when you separate yourself from all your unbelief and believe God, walk out strictly, carrying the commandments, doing everything that's right, then God will say, every promise in the book is yours. Amen. All yours. Turn from it. From Genesis to Revelations, it's all yours. Amen. If you abide me and my word in you, you can ask what you will. It'll be, what? You've got to separate yourself first from your unbelief. You say, Brother Bram, you're making it awful close. Jesus said, in the days of Noah, there were eight saved. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. How many is that, Brother Bram? It may be 8,000, maybe 8 million. I don't know what it is. But it's going to be in the minority. One out of every 100,000 or something like that, I'd say. All right. Psychic belief. Mental belief without a born-again experience. Emotional, ecclesiastical, creed. If true, genuine, Holy Spirit's enough, punctuate that word, and that word will live. Just exactly like you said it was. Because it's the same Spirit spoken, speaking through you. It has to live. It certainly it is. Not you the speaker, but the Father that dwelleth in you. He's the one that does the speaking. All right. Abraham, an heir of all things. I, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost like you people did. I like to walk through it like a big arcade. Everything there belongs to me. I'm heir of every bit of it. And if I heir to arcade, I, I'd like to find out what I got. When I become a Christian, I won't know what I own. So if I had an arcade, I'd go through and pull a drawer out and see what's in here. Look over here and see what's in there. Something seemed to be a little bit high up there. I'd get me a step ladder and climb up to it. I'd find out what it was. Something seems a little bit I'm a reacher. I'd get on my knees and start praying until I rise up to it. It belongs to me. God promised it. Divine healing, the power of God, all these miracles and signs and wonders, He promised it. That Brother Bram, how does these things work? By the promise of God. 
Amen. Seed of Abraham. Glory. I feel good. I may look crazy and act crazy, but just let me alone. I feel better this way than I did the other way. Fourteenth chapter. We'll go to that. Abraham. Now we find out in the fourteenth chapter what happened. The kings come down from the different parts of the country and was confederate with the kings of Sodom and went in and took Sodom, took Lot, Abraham's brother to, and the Lord, took him on out, his lukewarm denominational brother, and went off with him. Now remember, God had just told Abraham that everything in the land was his. And the meek shall inherit the earth. Say, we're crazy. Go take the earth. What's on the earth? Sure, we fall heir to it. Look at Satan said to Jesus, if you fall down, worship me, I'll give you this world. All the kingdoms are all controlled by the devil. Every one of them. Jesus said so. The Bible speaks it. Every nation and every kingdom is controlled by the devil. And Satan said, I own these. These are mine. I'll give them to you if you'll worship me. Jesus knows he fell heir to him in the millennium. So he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He knew that he was heir to it. And today they talk about crazy people worshiping the Lord and being born again. They're afraid of that being born again. They just don't like that idea. And they've substituted something for it. One of them has substituted a handshake. The other a little sprinkle of water. The other stick out his tongue and take a piece of bread. The other dance around on the floor. It's a birth. Yes. I said the other night, a birth is a mess. I don't care where it's at. If it's in a pig pen or a hospital room. It's a birth. It's a mess. And so is a new birth. It tears you up. But out of that mess comes new life. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. Abraham knew that everything belonged to him. So therefore, when Lot come in, he said, now, wait a minute. Lot was taken out by a cruel hands of enemy. He said, that's my brother and I'll go after him. I remember there's about seven or eight kings there. They went together and come down and took everything and swept out with it. And when they went out, Abraham took his servants and went after him to bring back his lost brother. That's real Christian. Went after his lost brother. What did he do when he found him? He slaughtered the kings and returned back, bringing his brother after the battle. Look, there was one king come out to meet him coming back, Melchizedek. Melchizedek. What was he? He had no father. He had no mother. He never was born. He never does die. Without father, without mother, without beginning of days or ending of life. It wasn't the son of God because he had father and mother. Both was born and died and rose again. But this man never had father nor mother. It's God. Yeah. Certainly it's the only thing that is eternal. And he met Abraham after the battle was over. Showing it to Abraham's seed. That's we go after our fallen brother. Yeah. And the battle's over. What did Melchizedek serve? Wine and bread, the communion. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When the battle's over, brother. Come back, bringing his lost brother back home again, restoring him back. And when the battle was over, Melchizedek met him and gave him the communion. Jesus said, I'll not eat or drink the fruit of the vine no more until I eat it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Yes, sir. Now, the battle was over. Abraham had come back, the 14th chapter, and the victor met him when he was coming in with the victor. Genesis 15 now, before we close, because it's closing time now. Listen to one more thing before we go, and I have to take this up tomorrow night again, because I just haven't got to my subject, I get to my place yet. On Jehovah Jireh, I wanted to get it down there, if the Lord willing. Now, on the 15th chapter, I got here, that the covenant was confirmed to Abraham. The confirmation of the covenant. In other words, it's when God oathed and when God made the promise and confirmed the promise. To Abraham. In the 15th chapter, we find out that the confirmation of the oath that God said, Abraham said to God, the heir of my house is still this Eliezer of Damascus. And he said to him, but that is not your heir. For it's one from your own bowels is your heir. And he promised him, said, how will I know this? Oh, now, brethren, here's something that will wake you up. Watch him. He said, go get me a she-goat, a, a three years old, a she-heifer, three years old, and a ram, a three years old. And Abraham took them and two turtle, a turtle dove and a pigeon. 
Now, the turtle dove and pigeon has a representation. These three-year-old animals, and there was three of them. Now, he's going to make the covenant, confirm the covenant. Now, listen close. Don't miss it. And then we pick up tomorrow night when he meets him here again, the Lord willing. Watch. Now, he said, take me a, a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, a pigeon and a turtle dove. And Abraham went and got the animals, and he cut them in half and laid them piece to piece. But the turtle dove and dove, he did not uh, separate the turtle dove and pigeon. Turtle dove and pigeon is the same family. So that represented divine healing, which in both covenants is by faith, see, that they're healed, just one to the other. other. If the old covenant had divine healing, you know, how much more is this one got? <laughs> see, if the old sacrifice had healing, what about this one, which is much better? See? Now, but notice what he done here. He took these three animals and cut them apart and laid them piece by piece. And then Abraham got back. Now, that was a sacrifice. And he watched until the sun was going down and fowls come down out of the air on Abraham's sacrifice. Vultures. And Abraham cast them out. Shoot them away. What's it the type of? Abraham's seed in the last day casting out devils from the sacrifice. Yeah. Casting away from the sacrifice. God promised it. The sacrifice, Christ the saint, yesterday, today, from ever, and all them unbelieving spirits trying to devour it. The man of God, the Abraham seed, stands there casting out the devils away from it. Confirming the covenant now, the confirmation, showing that Abraham seed in, I mean the royal seed, remember the natural seed failed because accepted law instead of the word of grace. And so has it in this Right about in the Gentiles the last day, but there is a seed, yes. royal seed with the word, Amen. stands true, casting out devils, doing great signs and wonders, getting all the unbelief away from the word, keeping the sacrifice clean, Amen. keeping the word holy, keep it reverence, not put anything with it, add anything to it, just keeping it away, yes. standing on guard, Amen. letting nothing touch it. Now notice, there come a deep sleep upon Abraham. Death. And after the deep sleep, he saw a furnace of fire, which is hell, smoking, that every sinner ought to go to. But before there went a little white light. Watch that little white light. Went in between and separated these sacrifices. When in between it, God making a confirmation that what to Abraham's seed he would do. Now, the Jews always believed God was one, and God is one. But he was showing here by these three clean sacrifices that the Trinity of God would be represented in one in the Godhead bodily. Now, notice, in the old, old days, in the old rental days, when a covenant was made, here's the way they did it. Like we come and we killed an animal. We split the animal in two and we stood between the animal. And there we wrote a covenant. Now, in China, how, in Japan, when they make a covenant, they get some salt. And they stand and make their promise and they throw salt on one another. That's the way in Japan they make a covenant. They throw salt. Salt's the Savior, you see. And they throw salt on one another. That's a, that's a, a covenant. Now, in America, how we make a covenant, we go out and have a bite to eat and shake hands. Give me your hand, boy. Is it agreed? It's agreed. That's a covenant. But in the old times, in Abraham's time, the way they made a covenant was kill a sacrifice and stand between this sacrifice. And then when they did, they wrote out the covenant on a piece of lamb skin. Then they tore it. One took one piece and one took the other. Now, when this covenant was confirmed and brought together, there's no one could impersonate that. See, it has to dovetail letter by letter, just exactly the way it was. That shows that the rightful owner of this piece has a part. This is the same covenant that it has to come together and dovetail just exactly the same. And God was showing there to Abraham that through his seed that God himself would become flesh and then have to be separated at Calvary 
where Christ being God on earth, he was separated. God tore him apart, the royal seed of Abraham, and took the life out of him and raised up the body up to set on his throne in heaven and sent back the spirit of him up on the church that the church has to say the same spirit was in Christ to make it come together, making Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Confirmation of the covenant. God confirming the covenant. God separating, carrying the life from Christ his Son. Taking the spirit out of him as he cut these animals in two. Standing between the animals. The light, God himself, went between them. Showing that he separated the body, the seed, the royal seed. And took the spirit and sent it back upon the church. And the church of the day that goes to meet Christ will have to have the same spirit that he had because it'll have to be letter by letter, word by word, and he is the word. Jesus said, he, personal pronoun, that believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also. Confirming the covenant, the life that's in Christ will be in the church, the royal seed of Abraham. A moment, brethren, on Pentecost, when they were in the upper room, if you was ever there and seen the real diagram the way it was drawn out, they went around a step on the outside and went up to the upper room. They had little olive oil candles burning. They were up there for ten days and nights with all the doors closed. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues like fire, farked tongues of fire, set up on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, ran out into the court speaking with the other languages. Notice, what was this spark of fire? Was a pillar of fire. The Holy Spirit. God. The angel that led him through the wilderness. The one that was made manifest before him. God had separated himself and divided himself amongst the people. The Holy Ghost. And together we are the church of the living God. Amen. The covenant. Abraham and his seed after him, the royal seed, the very life that was in Christ in the church, doing the same works that Christ did. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful thing, friends. It's just time I just got to close this. It's, I'm going to be too late. Uh, uh, I, 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 can it be all right if I pick it up tomorrow night right here? I want to get to Jehovah Jireh so bad, but I want you to see that what it is that the thing of professing to be a Christian. Brethren, it's time the church got the... If God made these promises, they are true. They must come to pass. Let us bow our heads just a moment. This is rough and hard. It's cutting. I don't like to do that. This minister said to me, he said, Brother Brennan... Why so-and-so you do that? I said, I haven't got television programs to be sponsored. Radio. I just go like this where I can go anywhere. I said, who's going to tell him? There's got to be a boy somewhere saying. Now, God is here, friends. If you've called yourself the seed of Abraham and think that you are... Now, don't listen. It's your soul, friend. It's your soul. Don't take any chance with it. Because tonight may be the last time you get a chance to. If you're ashamed of your life, calling yourself a child of God, and living the way that you have lived, and you believe that the Word of God is true and you're wrong, I want you just to pray for a moment. Ask God to examine your life. Heavenly Father, this could be the last night for many of us. We think a few nights ago in Los Angeles, an old woman, 70 years old, sitting there, and she walked up the altar and gave her life to Christ. That night she died in vain. Grace of God, 
that last hour, after living all those years without knowing him, and called her at the last hour. Amazing grace. Father God, speak to hearts here tonight. You know the intention of this. You know, Father, it's got to come a time that the, something's got to be done. We, we see the condition, and boy, it's getting worse all the time. And we realize that the Pentecostal church age in the last day is the Lady Ossian church age. The only one that Christ was put out of the church, standing, knocking, trying to get back in. Oh, God, be merciful. And as I scolded our sisters tonight, Lord, let them know that back there in the beginning, when it started, it was Eve. And here it is again, the gospel come in by the word. And how that she did what she did and looked today by reasoning. Look at her mother, what she thought was different. The same Bible. God, our brothers, is, I had to talk to them rough, Lord. I, I'm zealous. I, I, I love them. You know what, Lord, I, I, I put 31 years here for them. And you've confirmed your word and everything. I, Lord, I don't know what else to do, but when I see the church that I love, the Pentecostal church, the one that stood behind me and supported me. God, it's Christian love that makes you cut the evil away from it. It's love that makes you do that, Father. You know it is. And I'm trying to tell the people, don't try to go out there doing these things. The, the bars has been let out and we got hatched out to our different creeds and things that we brought into our church and getting away from the days of miracles, getting away from divine healing, get away from the, the way that people are to act and dress. And you made a covenant with Adam and one with Eve. You put different covenant and different all together and said it was wrong for the woman to act like the man. She'd be femi- she should be feminist and not masculine. And the day she tries to be masculine, the man feminist, Lord, and, and this right here at the last days, right here at the West Coast, Right here at the end of civilization, we find the women doing exactly the corruption as they did in the first. And here it is, God in amongst our sisters. Oh, God, that, is, that breaks my heart, Lord. And I know if it makes me a sinner feel that way, what does it do to you? To see how that become a goddess in this fabulous Hollywood glamour of sin and the used to be wrong for them to go to picture shows and then the devil throw it right in their house. And all kinds of uncensored programs and vulgar on the street. And, oh God, it's, a, it's an insane time. It's a neurotic time. It, it's a time when man won't stop and listen and check up. And under emotions and so forth, they still claim to be Abraham's seed. God, how you said it would, the spirits would be so close in the last days with impersonations until they'd almost deceive the elected ones, if it would be possible. And here it is. God, don't let these people, don't let one do that. Please, Father, I pray for them, each one. In the name of the Lord Jesus, grant. Now, while we have our heads bowed, i do anything for you. And if I bottle people out just to be mean, God would never be with me. I don't deserve to be here. I deserve to be out yonder somewhere chopping wood or something. But friends, that, that's true. Search it and see if it is in the scripture. It's supposed to be revealed in this last days. Now, are you sincere enough? Are you really down beneath that crust of the outside? Is there a real genuine something about you? That you're willing to admit that you're wrong. By every head being bowed, every heart, in deep, solemn consecration. Would you raise up your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Brown. I'm wrong. By God's grace, I'm going to straighten out. God bless you. You, you, you. That's right. Put up your hand. He sees you. In the balconies, God sees you. Raise your hand. Are you? Are you? That's it. I hear some of you women sitting here with short hair and don't have your hand up. What's the matter with you? You are wrong. Don't you try to meet God like that. You'll be condemned as certain as I'm standing this pulpit. You mean the Pentecostal church has gotten such a shape that it's, it's, it's got so callous till it's so ashamed to admit it's wrong? Don't you do that. God be merciful to you. I believe. Have faith. Let me wait again. God bless you over there, honey. 
God bless you, sister. That's good. Well, that's God bless you. That's right. You might admit it now. In the morning may be too late. An hour from now may be too late. God bless you. That's sincerity. God bless you. Say, I'm wrong. I, it takes a real person to admit they're wrong. That's genuine something. God bless you, lady. God bless you, lady. God bless you. That's right. Let's just keep great. Let God bless you. If I miss seeing your hand, you know, he knows every thought that's in your mind. That's exactly right. God bless you. I see your hand. That's good. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, sister. That's good. God bless you, dear young lady. Yes, to turn roads of life before these old things, this callous young heart, turn to God now, honey. That's right, you do it. I got a little daughter over there about your age. God bless you, honey. God bless you. Yes, God bless you, sister. What about you, brother? Shame on you. Let your wife act like that. Wear shorts and dress like that and get on the street. Call yourself a son of God. Don't you ashamed of yourself? God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. That's right. Admit you're wrong. If you, he that covers his sin shall not prosper. He that confesses his sin shall have mercy. God bless you. Any more? Like in the balcony. Up there in the balcony. He sees you up there. He knows every thought that's in your heart. Now raise your heads just a minute. I say there's somewhat 50 or 60 in this room put up their hands. Young and old, thank you. That's real lady and gentleman. I appreciate you. There's, there's hopes for you when you're willing to admit you're wrong. Before I make the altar call, I'm going to pray for these handkerchiefs. Heavenly Father, these handkerchiefs represent sick people. Mothers and fathers that's waiting. Children. One time we were taught in the Bible that they'd taken from the body of St. Paul handkerchiefs and aprons. The people saw him, know that the Spirit of God was on him. Paul remembered that Elisha told the Shunammite woman and told Gehazi, take this staff and go lay it on the child. He knew that what he touched was blessed. Paul, they'd taken from his body handkerchiefs and aprons and unclean spirits went out of people. Diseases departed. Now, Lord, we're not St. Paul. But you're still God, the same God. One day, Israel was on its road, right in the line of duty, going to the promised land. And something cut it off from the promised land, the Red Sea. One writer said, God looked down through that pillar of fire with angered eyes. And the sea got scared. And it rolled back its walls and opened up a dry path for Israel to cross over to the promised land. God, when these handkerchiefs are taken to the sick and afflicted, May the God of heaven look down through the blood of his own son. May the devil that's holding them sick people get scared and move away. On these handkerchiefs of tokens of this meeting tonight, where word and truth has been brought to pass. Sick and afflicted be made well. Hearts that are broken up and going down to the potter's house in a few minutes. Grant that the devil will leave and the people will cross over into that land of good health. God promised them. I send these handkerchiefs in the name of Jesus Christ for that purpose. Amen. God knows your heart. He knows your condition. Just to show, and let me tell you, there's a great bunch of people in here that did not raise their hand that ought to raise it. Now, if I call you right to this platform and say who you were, it hurts somebody's feelings. I've, you've seen me do that many times. I found out Jesus said, let the weeds and the wheat grow together. The angels will come and bind up the terriers and burn them first. And it's binding time now. Every one of them going into the confederation of churches, all the denominations. That's right. That's right. World League uh, Council of Churches, every denomination pulling right into it, the big thing going on. All of them coming back to Rome, just as they promised, an image made up to the beast, the power. The Confederation of Churches, just exactly what God said would come to pass. There they are, letting you go and telling you it's all right to do this. And they're afraid to say anything about it, afraid to break a meal ticket somewhere. Let me tell you something, my brother, sister. God revealed to you that I love you. It's not to be different, it's to be honest. Don't you take one chance. 
You wouldn't run a red light because of your body. What about your soul? Don't you cross one of God's red lights? Some of you are sick. Believe with all your heart. Somebody's desperate in something. Just have faith. I'll show you whether he really, whether it's the truth or not. Abraham, you remember the angel come to him and what he did? See if it's the same thing. Here's a little lady sitting right here, right out here. She's got cancer. She's got a cyst and she's up for an operation. She's looking at me now and them red beads around her neck. You're from Portland. But if you, if that's right, raise up your hand. That's right. I don't know you were strangers, but that's true. Now, how can you sit there with enough faith to touch the garment of Christ when that angel of light come over you like that? The grace of God. Yes. Accept it, lady. Believe it. Amen. Amen. I don't know that, but believe the whole gospel. Hallelujah. Here sits a woman sitting right back here. Look here, lady. Suffering with colon trouble. Believe with all your heart. Yes. You're a stranger to me. Believe with all your heart and get well. There's a man sitting by you. He has to go home. He can't stay much longer. He's got trouble with his ears. He's got a trouble with... A, he's had a cold and caused a cough. He can't get over it. It's, it's kind of uh, a lot of complications set in. That's right, sir. You work at some kind of a plant like missile or something like that. you got to go back to your work. I'm a stranger to you. If those things are true, raise up your hand. All right. If you've got faith enough to touch the Lord Jesus, why not be a real man and believe it with all your heart? There's a lady sitting back there. She's got some kind of a skin disease on her hands. She don't even know what it is. The doctor don't even know what it is. She's had it for years and years. Or she's going to miss it as sure as the world. Miss it. Daniels, McDaniels. There you are. Ida McDaniels. Bleed with all your heart. I don't know the woman, never seen her, but there's a light over. What is it? He knows you. And he knows that you're wrong. The same God that's speaking to me this way is speaking to me through the Word. Now, everyone in here that recognizes the presence of God and know that you've been wrong, let's come to the altar now. Come up here to sin. Let me pray for you. If you know you've been wrong, you want to confess you're wrong, you want to be a real Christian from now on, come on up here around the altar. I just don't want to call your name. It, it, it wouldn't be Christian like, up there in the balcony. Come on down. This is your opportunity. Come down now. Come to the altar. Say, I'm coming, Lord. Sinner, you make your way to the altar. This might be your last opportunity. Won't you come now while we, the organ's playing beautifully? I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. All right, everybody sing now. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Won't you come, come down out of the balcony? Come down, come up. What about you? You people are professing to be Christians. Abraham, see. God bless you, women. God bless you, my sisters. Yes. God surely will honor it. You are honest. Maybe your pastors failed to tell you that. Go home and get your Bible and find out whether it's right or not. You know it's right before I even say anything. You Pentecostal women, you wouldn't wear makeup for anything. There's nothing in the Bible about makeup on a Jezebel. She made up her face and stuff with paint and stuff. But there's in the Bible about you wearing long hair. It's an uncommon thing for a woman to pray with her head. You want to get right with God in the presence when he's here? Come on. Stand up, Mick. Stand for him. Stand to your feet and come down. And say, I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to make a show and I want the whole world to know that I'm wrong. And I want to be right before God. Come on now. Everybody, I am coming, Lord. Uh, there's more out 
out there, remember. Yes, that's right. Still coming, just keep praying. Now, friends, I'm not much to persuade you. I believe the word does its work when it goes out there. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It might be the last opportunity you'll ever have. I hope it's not. Do you know what it does to see you when you admit you're wrong? It says to me that there's something real there that you really want to do right. Now, just with the organ slowly, if you will, while I talk. Come on, people, just come right on. I want you to keep coming. You know what these people have done? Many of these are chartered church members. And they know I've told the truth. Not me. Just like when Moses went down there to tell the people about the Lord. And the Lord under that pillar of fire confirmed the word and showed that it was right. Yes. That same pillar of fire is right here with us. Yes. It's the same Christ. Doing the same thing for the Gentile age as he promised to do. What does it make me believe that you're genuine in your heart? What made you raise up to your feet? Because something was around you that said you're wrong. Now that was God because some of you feel embarrassed to stand here like that before the people after confessing. But it shows that this genuine something that said you're wrong. And it come with the word through discernment through what's these gifts sent to the church for what is the first gift what's the first thing apostles which is missionaries prophets teachers pastors evangelists they're all together for the perfecting of the church and where does the word of the Lord come to who the word of the Lord came to the prophet yes, yes. always amen Never question. Not a gift of prophecy. A gift of prophecy is on one than the other. A prophet's born, predestinated by God. Jesus Christ was a son of God, predestinated son of God. Isaiah told John, uh, John the Baptist 712 years before he was born, he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. God told Jeremiah, before you was even formed in your mother's womb, I know you and sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Yes. And when you see prophets appearing, judgment's at hand. Yes. Now judgment begins in the house of God with the people of God. Amen. Now we're wrong. Right. We've done wrong. And I believe that them sitting here tonight, that's Abraham's seed and really predestinated to the light of God to shine up on it. When the light strikes it, they'll stand. There's something has to happen. Yes. You're there. Now you're here. Let's bow our heads and confess our wrongs. Sinner friend, if you're standing in this group here, which there is some, shame on you. But blessings to you now. You've accepted it. Believe it with all your heart. You Christians, you women that know, I believe you're good women. God bless you. I believe that. God can express the feeling in my heart to you. I don't want to be mean to you, sister. I've got a wife too and two, two young girls. I love you as my sister. And brother, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. But sometimes a little shaken with the word helps you. Now, if we're wrong, let's say that we're wrong. And there's, there's grace abundantly for us tonight. He that will confess his wrongs, there's mercy for him. He that will hide his sin will never prosper. What is your sin? Your unbelief. If you hide it, understand, well, I'm just as good as the rest of them. You're wrong. And you'll never move any further than what you move now. You'll stay that way. You'll never go any further till you cross that barrier and make it right. Remember, you cannot do it. You'll have to walk for the Word of God. And as long as you live, you'll always remember this. The longest day you live, you'll remember tonight. Remember, I'm telling you, thus saith the Lord. I was sitting in the woods this afternoon praying. And you spoke to me about this year. It said, say it and call it. And I'll do something for you. Here it is. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, reverently and sincerely stand sinners in this audience right now. They've got up from their seat and walked up here just to make a confession. There's Christians who's come making their confession. Here's precious little sisters. 
that the light flashed across them way down in their heart. They knew they were wrong. They knew that the Bible teaches those things. And they're willing now to give it all up. Here's brothers standing here, precious brothers, sons of the living God, who through creed and lukewarm conditions has wandered out into the world. They're coming back tonight, Father. They're coming back. They're here they are. Now, Father, we realize that when they stood to their feet, they broke all scientists. They say that you can't move up. You're held down. But when they raise their hands and walk this away, they prove that there was a spirit in them that can make a decision. They've made it for Christ. Jesus, here's your own words. Now, I'm just going to quote them to you. I'm giving you these people tonight as your servant. I have done just as you told me to do today in the woods. And here's just exactly what you said would take place. And there's witnesses of those things standing here. To prove your, your presence, you went across the audience telling the people about who they were and where they've done and so forth. Knowing that people names who they were and what they've done. What's wrong? And now you said in your word... That he that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. He that's ashamed of me before man, him will I be ashamed of before my Father and the holy angels. Now these sisters and these brothers have stood tonight in the presence of their members and their pastors and their loved ones. To say that, that they're not ashamed of you, but they're ashamed of the way they've done now, I'm sure, Lord, that you forgive them. You promised it. You said, he that will confess his sins has mercy. And they are confessing it, and they shall have mercy. And you who can heal the sick, and say, isn't it as easy? Say, thy sins be forgiven thee as it is. Take up thy bed and walk. I claim these. I, I claim every one of them, Lord. I've tried to stand for you all these years in your word. And they have stood tonight for you. And I claim them. I take them out of the jaws of the world. And I present them to you, Lord Jesus. They are the trophies of the message tonight of the word of God. Keep them, almighty God, under your holy power. May they grow. May the light of God flash up in their life. May those men and women, Lord, start growing in the power and strength of the Holy Ghost. May something take place that will change their whole churches and a whole neighborhood where they're at. Grant it, Lord. I give them to you. They are yours. They, they are the trophies of the meeting tonight, of the word that's been preached. I claim their life in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to meet them at the other side on, when they're immortal, turn back to young men and women again and be young and lovely forever. They are yours, Father. They are trophies that God has given to His Son, Christ Jesus, by the power of His presence and the Word of God. They are yours, Father. I give them to you in Jesus Christ's name and claim every life Every life that's standing here, every confession is received. Every sin is forgiven. And every one that's standing here, I, I, I pray for Holy Ghost strength in them to carry out, to do that which is right. To help them in this dark hour when the world is so full of glamour. And oh God, help me tomorrow night to, to bring it clean and clear to them, Lord. And cut loose from glamour of this world that they might be ready to meet Christ at the time of His coming. Granted, Father, we believe You now. And while we have our heads bowed, each one of you that's standing on your feet, I don't believe you come for curiosity because you come under rugged, hard, gospel-preaching cutting. But you believe that Jesus said that no man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all the Father has given me will come. Now that's a confirmed word of God. He told Abraham, he promised and swore to the oath. And here you heard the voice of God tonight and come upon those bases. You've got to be forgiven. Amen. 
and all of you accept it and believe that God forgives you of your error. And from this night, henceforth, by the grace of God, you'll live for Him the rest of your life and do everything that this Bible teaches for you to do. And you believe that God gives you the grace to do it now by forgiving you your past. Raise up your hand and say, I believe it with all my heart. God bless you. All of you Christians out there that's proud of them, say, praise God for them. Let's say it again. Praise God for them. Now, let us stand to our feet, everyone. I want a card of I love him, I love him, because he first loved me and purchased my salvation on Calvary. Let's all together now, everyone sing it with their hands up. All right. I love him. Don't the word kind of scrub you out, make you feel better, does it? You don't believe me to be a, a, a fake, do you? You believe me to be the truth? I'm watching right now that angel of the Lord who I watch over the people has circled right around over this group, standing right here in the form of the cross. God in heaven. The same picture, you, angel, you see on that picture is right here, right now, over this group of people. It's moving around. I keep watching it from place to place. I believe even that every sickness is standing in that crowd is gone. I, I believe it with all my heart. That every sin is forgiven. Let's just, let's just shake one another's hands while we sing, I love him. I say, praise the Lord. Love him. I love him. Be bringing the people in for your word is sharp like a two-edged sword but it discerns the thoughts of the heart it makes sure it circumcises the world the flesh the worldly things away from the people and makes them new creatures in Christ how we thank you father we praise you with all of our hearts thank you for him Lord may they be filled with the spirit may the Holy Ghost just take them into his control and may there break out an old-fashioned revival among these churches, Lord, that will just sweep all out through the communities, everywhere on fire, with the power of God. Send us real Pentecost, Lord, real power of the Spirit back into the lives of the people. Granted, Father, they're yours. By the grace of God, they're yours. They're Abraham's seed, according to the promise. Granted, Lord, they believe your word. Anything contrary as though it wasn't. They believe the word because they're Abraham's seed. They're yours, Father, predestinated church to shine in the last days. Thank you, Father, for that. I love him. Raise your hands now and praise to him. I 